Good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming to our final lecture of this series. By now, you should all be able to hack the Dickens out of the Russians, <laughs> or something like that. Um, just to uh, let you, to remind you, uh, I would love to hear from any of you about what you would like to hear next year. Uh, we're open for suggestions since we're sort of running out of our own ideas. <laughs> and um, I, I'll tell you that one of the ideas is we should go back to biology. As a geochemist, I find that almost insufferable, but maybe we'll have to do that. <laughs> so please send us ideas about the planets and the Earth, and I'll, I'll, I'll vote for that one. So I'd like to now uh, thank uh, the, the sponsors for this lecture series. Um, hang in there. Well, those are the guitarists and various other instruments. So thanks to the Bolton School. Thank you. So thank you again also to the title sponsors shown on the, on the uh, screen there, Roche, uh, the VPR for the University of Arizona, and Tucson Electric, Par uh, uh, Tucson Electric Power. They've been with us since the very beginning, and I thank them very much for their support. And I also thank the rest of the underwriters shown in this uh, slide right there. As I've mentioned in the various times that I've done it here, these folks uh, make it possible for us to do this lecture series for free. And uh, let me assure you that it's not free to cost. I mean, it's actually an expensive endeavor. Now, many of you uh, signed up for the Canyon Ranch business. And this is your last chance to uh, sign up. Now, if you sign up, you will get a free week stay at Canyon Ranch. Uh, sadly, they don't have any booze. That's. Uh, Actually, I'm not quite sure. I think they're changing their business plan. Uh, you can text, you can text that, that number over there, but if you're not interested in, um, in texting anything, you can also fill that little piece of paper and give it outside to the desk, and you'll also be uh, drawn. The drawing will be this week. It will be done, obviously, by artificial intelligence. <laughs> so there, there won't be any magic hand that goes into a basket. We'll just push a button, and the biased computer will come up with something. OK. The other thing that I'd like to mention to all of you is that one of the things that uh, the College of Science also has is the Biosphere 2. And through the Biosphere 2, we've created one of these uh, MOOCs, the massive online courses, that gives various chapters discussing a variety of issues with the environment and global climate change. It's free. So all of you are welcome to sign in and learn about uh, what we have learned from with Biosphere 2. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the folks that have actually made this particular lecture series and many others uh, as successful as they are. I'd like to ask a few of you people to sort of wave and stand up. John Pollard and Margaret Wilch back there. And they're the folks that are actually trying to educate teachers and students. It's, it's terrific. As it's been mentioned before, the lecturer then goes away into some room with students and teachers and spends another hour. And it's Margaret and John that actually have created that. The beautiful imagery that comes when you come here at 6.30 or whatever, uh, that's Carl Philobaum, which not only uh, is beautiful, but it's actually uh, informative, very informative. I've been told that if you're interested in some of these slides, uh, we'd be happy to pass them along. Centennial Hall staff, which uh, have been terrific partners, and the College of Science staff, which is absolutely extraordinary. And at the lead of this, uh, the producer of this uh, endeavor is Bo Baylor. I'm not sure where Bo is, but she's probably hiding. And she's the one that actually makes uh, this thing tick away like a Swiss watch. Um, but, but more importantly, I want to thank all of you for coming here week after week, uh, to listen to us, uh, to show that people still are interested in, uh, in continuous education, and that appreciate uh, the efforts that go on in putting all of this together. Thank you all for coming. And I want to just thank one of you more than the rest of you, and thank you, Gabby Giffords, for being here tonight. Thank you. <laughs>
As the saying goes, you're all my favorite children, but she's more favorite than the rest of you. <laughs> now let me introduce today's speaker, Vindel Casino, a friend, an amazing scientist, uh, and an amazing administrator here at the University of Arizona. He's the Vice President for Academic Initiatives and Student Success, Professor in the School of Geography and Development, and he's Affiliate Faculty Member in Social, Culture, and Critical Theory Program. In his administrative role, uh, Vin, <laughs> there he is. <laughs> There's somebody that looks worse than I look. <laughs> uh, thanks, Joaquin. <laughs> Uh, in his administrative role, Vin uh, uh, launched the UA Online. You know, we were actually sort of behind the eight ball uh, forever in digital education, and Vin came in and put us ahead of the curve. It's incredible what he's done. And he's also in charge of a program called 100% Student Engagement, which is actually how do we get our students out there and, that, and, cre and, and learn from doing instead of sitting in a classroom for five years. Uh, as a teacher and researcher, Vin has worked in the intersections of social geography, health geography, and the study of human and non-human relations. His recent work has been published in journals such as The Lancet, Infectious Diseases, Health in Place, and Progress in Human Geography, where he is the first U.S. scholar to be invited to write the Progress Reports on Social Geography, which he published on food, robots, and bugs. Vin has also published on the state of higher education in the Los Angeles Times, the Arizona Republic, and Inside Higher Education. Please join me in welcoming Vin Del Casino. Oh. Am I good? All right, let's see. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? All right, let me see, see what's going on. Uh, so far, Joaquin's insulted me, and um, I have to present in front of Gabby Giffords. No one else had to do that so far in the series. No pressure here at all. Um, well, let me start by just saying thank you um, for inviting me to be part of this conversation. I think it's been a fabulous six weeks. I've learned a ton from it, and it's just been an amazing opportunity for me to think about some of the things I've been thinking about. Before I go any further, real quickly, I just want to thank two more people personally as one of the presenters, uh, Ken Godat and Danny Pagano, who have worked on these slides throughout. Um, absolutely amazing visuals. And I made them do changes uh, at 4.15 today. I think that's, um, so, so he cut me off. He finally said, Vin, no more changes. Carl's on his way. It's too late. It's over. So I said, all right, fair enough. Um, so the, I was talking, I was at the first week, and Roger Miesfeld, who's the head of chemistry here, said, wow, Vin, you're in this series. Why is that exactly? <laughs> and I said, that's a really good question, Roger. It's Nirov's fault, Nirov Merchant. So the truth is, I've been thinking about um, the question of automation um, and what our robotic futures might look like and what that means for human life. And I think that's how I got enrolled in this conversation. And in fact, one of the things that Joaquin had kind of asked me to take up was the question of labor. What's the future of work going to look like? So as a good academic, I summarily ignored that and came up with a completely different talk. <laughs> Actually, the truth is I am going to focus on that, but I'm going to do it with a focus toward the end of this talk on one industry in particular, the one we're sitting in right now, higher education. So I'm going to talk about sort of where big data is going, what it means, how it's been picked up socially, how it's changing our lives, and then I want to look at kind of the impacts on higher ed and how higher education is going to respond in the big data world. So, like any good person, I'm going to start in 2159 because as Stefan reminded us at the beginning of the talk, you know, um, there's no such thing as really looking forward. But I'm going to do it anyway, and I'm going to do it through the right way, which is science fiction. And through the movie Elysium, which I do not recommend that anybody watch. But the story is important for us here. Elysium is actually a Greek word. Um, it's where the gods went after they retired, you know, so to speak. Well, in the movie Elysium, there's a space station that's, surround, that's floating around the Earth. And on that space station, there's this idyllic world where Jodie Foster gets to live and govern as uh, the head of defense, where they have healing beds, 
where people can just get on them and live forever. It's a wonderful place. Well, everybody else lives in Los Angeles. <laughs> and it's not a movie without destroying Los Angeles, where the illegals of Elysium are left. There's a racialized politics to this, but thank God we have Matt Damon who's going to save the day. <laughs> where people have to engage robot parole officers. And if you want to try to escape, you have to have cybernetic materials drilled into your body and fight your way into Elysium. Now, this world is governed by a simple code. You're either a citizen of Elysium or you're not. It's governed by an algorithm. And we've spent a lot of time in this series talking about algorithms. In the simplest form, an algorithm is just a step-by-step -step procedure for solving a problem. I love that definition. It sounds so nice. <laughs> the other definition, which Jane Baumbauer brought up, is a set of rules to govern a system. And I want us to reflect on both these definitions tonight and think about them as we think about the world that we're creating. Now, within that, then, I want to take my cue from Donna Haraway, who's been a leading thinker around the intersections of social life and technology. And what Donna Haraway says is that technology is not neutral. We talk a lot about it as if it's out there. And what she argues is we inhabit that technology, and the technology inhabits us. This is an important theme for me tonight, because I want to really reflect upon the interrelationship between ourselves and technology. Now, is the Elysium scenario the world we want? I know sitting here in higher education, I know it's not the world we're trying to produce, but it is an interesting question. Now, you go, come on, Vin, it's fiction. I mean, give me a break, right? It's not like anybody's ever gonna invent the cell phone. <laughs> and it's, it's not like anyone's gonna ever create a tablet computer. I mean, come on. It's not like people are going to make replicators <laughs> or even tricorders. This is actually my favorite one because Peter Jansen in, the, Jansen in the School of Information actually built a tricorder. That's like the coolest thing ever. Now, the other thing too is it's not like robots, you know, science fiction tells us robots are going to have emotions. Oh, we don't have to worry about that. Well, Saudi Arabia just granted citizenship to a robot. That's an interesting question. What is our world going to look like with citizen robots? I'm just going to let that sink in for a second. And feminists have actually started to build anatomic dolls that can give consent before having sex. You laugh. Go to Google Scholar, type in robot, consent, sex, call the IT department first, let them know you're going to type that into Google Scholar, <laughs> and see what comes up. There's a lot of articles on this topic. Now, the other thing that's come up throughout this series is the kind of tension between artificial intelligence and organic intelligence. And I stole this from Jane because I just thought it was great, you know. And there's a sense of it being either or. We're going to live in a world governed by artificial intelligence, or we're going to be in a world governed by organic intelligence. And the truth is, it's a both-and scenario. There's not a separation like we like to think about. In fact, we inhabit that world all the time. So within that, then, this talk is actually about life itself and the kind of world we want to inhabit and what it means when we live in a world of big data. So, what have we learned so far in this talk, in this series? Well, Stefan Kubaroff started us off with mach saying machines do what we ask. That's a relief, right? At least we're in that stage right now. Mihai Sardanyu argued that machines are not yet good at being in the world, right? They can't do the cognition that we can do. Nirav Merchant said, oops, whoa, that was trippy. Anybody see that happen? 
That was just me, right? No one else saw that. Okay. That humans, near of Merchant argued humans are going to work alongside machines. And Louis von Ahn told us, actually, we're all being used for his experiments. <laughs> I can say that because he's not here. <laughs> and Jane Bambauer raised the question about the morality that machines will inhabit. These are all important questions. And within this, what we've learned so far in this series is that we're in the age of intelligence augmented, IA, not yet an age of artificial intelligence. And this is important because we talk a lot about AI as if it's there and working and doing all these things all the time. Same thing for big data. Well, language matters, and I want us to pay attention to that tonight. So context is important for any talk, in my opinion. And I guess, since I have the microphone, I get to project the context. Well, we know we've been talking a lot about this world of rapid techno-social change that we live in. There's been buzz about the fourth industrial revolution of cyber-physical systems where biological, physical, and digital life all comes together. And that's really interesting, because it produces this progressive notion and in fact, the interesting thing about revolutions is the next one's just potentially around the corner. So within this world, though, of this kind of notion of progress, of this movement through the world from mechanization up to potentially artificial intelligence with the current stop in the fourth industrial revolution, we have the world we inhabit now. And that's a world marked by difference. This pyramid represents global wealth. And we know within the United States that more and more people, fewer people are controlling more and more of the wealth of the country. So let's reflect then on the rapid socio-technological change in the context of this. And it wouldn't be a presentation by a geographer if there wasn't at least one map. <laughs> this is a map of broadband access in rural communities in the United States. There's Arizona. The dark colors are the good places where they have high access. <laughs> Just in case that's not clear from the map. <laughs> and we also have the movement of electronic waste the distribution of the material byproducts of the revolutions that we're sitting in. In fact, people literally sit in fields of hard drives and computer products in Nigeria, in China, in India, rebuilding computers from the stuff that's been basically thrown away, mostly by us. What's also interesting is there is a conversation about what we call the digital divide, those who have access and those don't. But recently, studies have actually shown that the digital divide may not be about who has access or not, but who knows how to shut it off. And there's a class politic to who understands when it's time to turn that machine off and have that conversation. The other thing that's going, ha going on right now and happening quite quickly is the change of the workforce environment itself. Everyone keeps saying the jobs of tomorrow will not look like they do today. And that's true. We don't know exactly what they'll look like. But the question really is then, what happens in relation to all those job changes? Who is going to have the opportunity to access that? Now. All right, let's go back to the, the revolutions. What we have today is we have people who live in the first industrial revolution, the second industrial revolution, the third industrial revolution, and the fourth industrial revolution. And this is the world we inhabit. It's not the Elysium scenario, but it's not something we should tread lightly about. And we should think about the effects of what we're doing and the impacts they have. So a lot of people worry about this.
And that's a legitimate worry. My bigger concern is who'll have access to the world we're creating when we integrate humans, data, and machines at the level that I suspect we will. All right, that was social science guy buzzkill boy. Sorry. <laughs> I'll try to pep it up now. All right, so within this, we now have this thing called big data. And I'm going to use the word thing a lot in deference to one of my former professors at the University of Kentucky who hated graduate students who used the word thing. I'm going to use it over and over and over again tonight. <laughs> he also hated stuff. He said, don't ever put stuff in things. And every paper from a graduate student for, I think, an entire semester started th thing and stuff or stuff and things. Anyway, sorry. How do we define big data? Well, the first thing is it's big. Very clearly big. I mean, obviously, it's, that's the first word. It's got volume. What do we mean by that volume? Well, as Nirav Merchant pointed out, we have this intense amount of data in the world. I mean, we got seven and a half billion people and almost five billion of them have cell phones, right? They're engaging in all this movement all the time. There's this kind of flow and this just mass of information, data bytes and bits flowing around, and they end up somewhere. This is important. We haven't really talked about the physicality of big data, but big data is material. What do I mean by that? Well, they call it cloud computing because you're not near it. It actually should be called big hole in the ground computing. Because <laughs> it's not in the clouds. It's on a big swath of land in a giant farm. I guess it wasn't very practical to call it big hole in the ground. But if anybody goes there, I've trademarked it. You can't have it. <laughs> but the materiality of that is really important to understand. The data, they have velocity. I love that word. Velocity, it's just so animated, right? They move really fast. As Nurev pointed out again, we can download 15 terabytes of data from the stars in a night. We can start to sequence the genome at faster and faster speeds because the technology is caught up with our imagination. This was another important point of, the, of this entire series so far. We've caught up with the things we've been talking about on Star Trek for a long time. Just not the transporter thing. I want the transporter thing. <laughs> who's going to build that for us? Yeah, who's it? Right, exactly. I'm tired of the airlines. Losing my luggage. <laughs> that, that structured data, that big data of science is complemented by the massive amounts of velocity of things moving through the internet and other spaces. I mean, 87,000 hours of video streamed in one minute. I mean, massive amounts of velocity. And data are, not data is, data are, because they have variety. The way in which we think about big data today is the classic way that scientists think about data is in structured databases. But we have all this unstructured data now flowing through the world. And that variety is actually pre prevent, uh, producing opportunity, but also pr producing all kinds of challenges, I think, to us as humans. And then we're just deeply interconnected through the Internet of Things. People are smartphoning their light bulbs and you know, doing all kinds of amazing stuff with their phones and all kinds of things that are connecting everybody and the data is flowing through there. But big data is... Why singular? Why like this? Well, the question of big data is, is about its veracity, about its claim to the truth. And this is an important question that we have to ask ourselves tonight. Now, as Mihai talked about, you know, if you didn't see the talk, it was a good one. <laughs> right now, big data is doing a lot of correlative work. They're kind of seeing where are the relationships within the data. Nobody wants to see this, and Mihai definitely doesn't want to see this. Right? So, but at, despite the fact that big data is really doing this big correlative work, with, lot, with not a ton of precision, we're starting to see a new truth produced by it. And Jane brought this up, and I want to highlight this, 
because it's an important part of what I want to discuss this evening. The AI-generated reviews fool users, right? Jane showed us last week, if you didn't see it, you should download the talk. You know, facial recognition software that can actually mimic faces on the internet. My colleagues in the School of Information, uh, Vladimir Lysenko and Catherine Brooks, have written an article, it's coming out in First Monday soon, about Russia's actual build-out of an entire cyber operations network through the military, right? These things are actively engaged, and as this information flows, we're producing new sense of truth. So how then has big data become a thing? And I wanted, to, I wanted to call it a thing because I want to give it that material effect. I want to suggest to everybody in the room that it's actually acting on us like other things in the world. Well, it has a certain set of characteristics. The first thing is people talk about big data as if it's different. It's, some, it's a moment in time. And Sarah Ego talks about actually in relation to 20th century data collection that we've been collecting data on people and categorizing them for quite some time. It may not be that the practice has changed in big data. It may be the volume and the velocity has changed. But the idea of producing and differentiating data is not a new concept. But big data is given its sense is different. The other thing that's happening is big data is now the population. This is one of my favorite pieces by a couple of geographers in which they argue the little n is becoming the big N. So what do I mean by that? Well, in statistics, the little n stands for the subpopulation. You know when you watch Wolf Blitzer and he completely gets the entire presidential election wrong? You know that part, and he says 1,000 people were polled, and within 4%, X person is going to win, right? The assumption is I could poll those 1,000 people, that subpopulation, and they'll represent the rest of the world. Well, big data makes a claim on the whole population. Not just the subpopulations, but the entire thing. What happens when we believe we have access to everything you are? Big data is real. It's in real time. Great book, by the way, Kathy O'Neill, Weapons of Math Destruction. A mathematician who went and worked on Wall Street in 2007. Just read that book. I won't say anything else. But the idea is that big data is capturing real time and it's happening now. But the reality, are, reality is, the reality, realities are, or reality is, pick one, Vin. I'll go with reality is. <laughs> the reality is that the models, the things that are telling you which Amazon book to buy, is based on a huge historical data set. There's nothing real time about that except for the next click that you've made that's been added to that system. The other thing is big data is happening everywhere. And I think this one's starting to come true. This map is one of my favorite maps. A couple of my colleagues 20 years ago drew this map for the Atlantic. This is New York City. Vinny Del Casino, map of New York City. Had to have a map of New York City. There's Macy's 34th Street. What this map does is it shows you every single camera that you would walk by on 34th Street that might capture your information. Now, in 1998, we did not have the processing capacity to do anything with that video. We do now, and there are a lot more cameras out there. So that sense of state surveillance is really becoming enlivened, and we're starting to buy into the notion the question is going to be, is this right? Is this what we should be? And so as a result of all this, I want to argue that big data in our minds, in the social world, is gaining veracity. It's gaining a claim to the truth. And Data Boyd, uh, uh, probably one of the leading uh, kind of theorists and critics of technology today, doing some really interesting work, and Kate Crawford, argue that big data is actually in, uh, having an impact on our social science as well, where people are starting to believe they're seeing actual patterns in the data. This is a really important time then for us in higher education, because we have to reflect upon what that's going to mean for us. 
So how has big data gained its social meaning? How has it become this thing that we're all now responding to? Well, the first thing is you have to consume it to produce it. Big data doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists only because we interact with it. And it's an analytic framework built on inductive reasoning. <laughs> Gave me what I want, must be right. We've seen how dangerous that moment is. But that sense of inductive reasoning, of collecting up all these data, letting them talk to each other, and producing effects from that has had massive impacts. It certainly had impacts on the 2008 uh, crisis that we saw financially, and it's had impacts on all kinds of other things as well. Big data, though, is only brought to life by what my colleague Luis Amor in geography says is little analytics. Now, this is what we've learned. Machine learning is really good at pattern recognition. Actually, some amazing stuff. You know, Mihai's work is incredible. You know, be able to read a million articles. We can never read a million articles, right? But it's not yet good at being in the world, right? The, the, the computers don't have the cognition that they have. But what they're doing in machine learning is we're asking specific questions that are relatively speaking idiosyncratic to the rest of the world. That partitioning process gives us a sense of depth and truth that may not necessarily be there because right now you kind of have to pick the machine learning up and keep moving it right to the next question so that because it's pretty darn focused. So that, so, but it's brought to life by these little analytics and our engagement with it. The other thing that's going on is big data is calling upon a new kind of individual. The, the world is becoming personalized. Everything is becoming personalized for us. I go on the phone, it tells me exactly what I need, what I used last week. I don't even have to shop. I could shop for the same exact things at the supermarket and have them delivered. I'm living in this world now, and we have to ask ourselves, what are, what are the consequences of that? But there's no doubt that people are enjoying that and engaging that, but there's this causative effect. And the irony of the hyper-individualism is the thing I'm about to say next, which sounds counterintuitive, and it probably is, but that whole system of individuals is dependent on this network of connectivity to enliven itself, right? All those connections, when you're being calculated by the algorithms, right? The algorithm is speaking to all the other kinds of data that are out there in the world. This is so much more intense than the Kevin Bacon thing. <laughs> Way more intense than Kevin Bacon. That was largely for me, but I'm glad some of you left. What big data is doing is it's constituting new algorithmic subjects. The algorithm, as you remember, is a set of processes and rules. Our subjectivity is the individualization and socialization of ourself. We're engaging algorithmic life and producing a new way of seeing ourselves that is both individual and social at the same time. And this is actually an incredibly important question. In fact, in my opinion, one of the most important questions that we might ask in the 21st century is how we see and perform ourselves in relation to all these rules, to all these algorithms. All right, but does big data exist? And of course, I'm a both-and person, so the answer is yes and no. You all came for one answer, didn't you? I'm really sorry. <laughs> Big data is produced by these kind of relations. These small moments in time are collected up. But big data, in my opinion, is only made real by us. Oops, we'll do one at a time. The, the algorithm creates big data out of the bits and bytes. So the big data is not a priori to the algorithm. The algorithm actually, through its relationship with all that data, 
makes it real. Big data becomes a thing then by our relations to it and the questions we ask of it. Therefore, there is no big data in the singular sense. It's not just out there, it's with you, in your pocket, right now, on your phone. And so, in my mind, there's life, there are data, and there's life with data and analytics. And all of that churn is producing the big data world we live in. Now, what's happening, though, is socially, we're starting to move into a data-driven world. So for anyone around here who works with companies, if they come to you and say, we're data-driven, run. <laughs> I don't want to be driven by my data. I'm not even ready to be driven by one of my children, right, when they turn 16. But the sense that somehow data is driving the answer, when data is just the information, we're the answer, so why data-driven? Well, actually, some people have said, all right, we're data-informed. I like that one a little better. I'm informed by my data. I don't necessarily believe my data, but I'm informed by it. For me, though, I'm a, I'm a social scientist. I'm a qualitative researcher, and I actually think the most interesting thing in all this data churn is the error. So, what, let me explain this in, in a particular example. So I, went, I, I was working at Cal State Long Beach in 2000, and I met a psychologist. And the psychologist did quantitative research. He said, Vin, I love social scientists who do ethnographic work, because you go out and you find all these things, and then I can build hypotheses out of that. And I go, Dennis, that's fantastic. You know, I love quantitative researchers, because you run these big, giant regressions, and at the end, there's this E, and I'm interested in all the churn that's going on in there. And this is, in fact, where we need to be in terms of our science, is every time we produce an answer, we have to ask ourselves, what was left out? What did we miss? And if we do that, then I think we'll have an opportunity. But it's really hard with things moving so fast. So within this then, I go, all right, we have this world, we're moving rapidly, and we have all this churn. So my question is, well, what's going to happen to the university? What happens to higher education as an industry, right? Many people are actually saying, look, this is great. We could automate teaching, right? You hear it. We could just, we can use data to figure out exactly what every single person in this room needs to learn. We deliver it to you, and then you walk home. Easy peasy. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Easy peasy. That's on Arizona public media forever. <laughs> it's actually generating, these questions are actually generating a lot of intellectual churn in higher education. Ryan Craig's book on unbundling higher ed, The End of College by Kevin Carey, Robot Proof, uh, a book by the president of Northeastern. And in fact, in College Interrupt, uh, Disrupted, Ryan Craig suggests we could end up with a two-tiered system of higher education. A bundled elite, where a few people get to enjoy that residential experience, and the unbundled other. And in fact, this has been the fear of online education. I oversee UA Online. We have 3,500 students in undergrad and grad. 25%, in fact, of the undergrads are actually returners to the University of Arizona, never finished a degree. But the anxiety that online education produces is intense because people simply feel, we'll just put up information, people will download it, take some tests, and there we go. And then we could just unbundle education, unfetter it from the institutions, and people could just run around grabbing courses and then build a degree or build their learning. There's actually some interesting things there, but I, I find deep concern in that question because I think it puts public higher education in particular at risk. Kevin Carey actually argues that we won't apply to college in the future, and we probably won't graduate from anywhere either. We will start to collect credentials and build ourselves 
through these processes. And so he, he suggests in order to sort of attract and maintain our connections, we're going to have to become like cathedrals. I don't know why cathedral, you know, but all right. You know, they need to build places real and virtual that learners return to throughout their lifetime. This is actually a good concept. This is the thing we've been talking about forever, lifelong learning. But the question is, if we've disrupted education and unbundled it, is there a place for them to return to? Right? And Joseph Uhn argues in his book that in the era of AI, the notion of knowledge collection and factual production seems pretty silly. And in fact, if you've been to this series, you would know we're going to be wasting a lot of time if I'm going to try to read a million articles in a science journal and figure out the connections to them when a computer can do it in 48 hours, right? And so how do we respond? What does higher education look like in this age of automation? This nonprofit industry, what does it reflect? What types of labor does it have here? And what do we build? And this is an interesting question for me. Well, there are some challenges then that come with this. The, the first thing is machine learning has produced the potential that education could become so personalized, as I mentioned, that it can take place at the individual level. As automation takes hold then, universities are actually being questioned. Just open Inside Higher Ed today and you'll find the Gallup survey basically says about 55% of people in the United States believe higher education is good or quite good. 18% of white men without a college degree believe that. We're in an age where higher education is being asked, what are you producing for the future world? And that future world is tied to what does the economy look like and these sorts of things. And in the context of this, public funding is waning. So we're in this kind of complex spiral where we're going to be put under pressure to kind of produce that personalized learning, but we're not going to necessarily have the funds to do it. So what does that look like? Well, how are we going to respond? And I think there's a few ways in which higher education responds to this highly interconnected world of data, machines, and humans. The first is we take hold of that learning and leverage the abilities of machine learning to really support education. Nirav talked about this with his Cyverse project. This is an incredible project where people can actually upload data and start to use computational systems to engage their data from anywhere in the world. It's actually an amazing service. It's probably one of the things we really need to do. The other things that are going on that tie to this are actually the open educational resources debate. And Pima Community College is actually a leader in open educational resources. They got a $100,000 grant to do that. Producing materials that students no longer have to pay for. Taking that knowledge and bundling it up. We're certainly doing that at the University of Arizona as well, but we're doing it in relation to all these sorts of projects uh, like Merlot, which is a really large open educational resource database as well as the California State University's open educational resource. You take that machine learning, you apply it to this incredible wealth of knowledge, and you produce back for students and other learners all this information that they can take advantage of. That's not where the teaching comes in, but that's where some of the learning can happen. The other thing is higher education can start to diversify the kinds of learning it does produce using the technologies to actually enhance and support human-to-human -human connection. What I mean by that is we can establish diverse points of entry to our institutions that get to distant others. Let's put it in another practical way. I would love everyone to come to these great institutions, but not everyone can make it. So how do we build an education that reaches them, but also connects them back? And I think we can do that. We do that by creating student-centered learning environments across all the modalities. You start with the question, how do you like to teach? What kinds of technologies would you like to use? And how do you create interactions between students and students and students and teachers? 
You can do this in any environment. Google Air lets you do live open discussion with dozens of people. Dozens is right. Is that fair, Angela? I'm looking at Angela just because she oversees the Office of Digital Learning. So when I say things out loud, sometimes I check myself like, so I'm not making it up. And we can leverage adaptive learning technologies to augment student learning. I know the question actually came up in, in the class, right? What, you know, with uh, Louis Von Ahn, you know, is Duolingo, he has this new software he's built to teach language. Is it going to supplant the kind of education we have today? And the answer he gave, I believe, was no, and I would agree. But there's really cool opportunities to leverage some of these technologies to do some of the things that aren't always easy at a distance. And I think we do need to think more about credit and non-credit options, the ways in which we deliver the content we have. Universities have been really parochial about their education. It all happens in the credit-bearing space. It's all about the classes. But there are so many different ways to deliver based on the technologies we've created to deliver content and have people engage with it. And I think that is important for us to respond. The other thing we can do is actually take advantage of this machine learning to do some of the cool things with, with data, you know, to leverage predictive analytics. And we've done this here. I'll give you one example because it's the one I know best. Um, we did, we have a, this predictive analytics model at the University of Arizona, and we use it to start to understand where students might be running into roadblocks. And in this case, it turned out that if a student got a C, in a writing class in their first year, they were much less likely to graduate from the university than a student who got an A or a B. It didn't show up in retention like they were there the next year, but four years out, not so much. Well, Inside Higher Ed got a hold of this and said, oh my gosh, you know, you're gonna make everybody take the class over. That wasn't the point. In fact, the point was, what kind of learning is going on in that environment? And that's what I meant when I talked about that error at the beginning, you get a result. You don't just take it. You go, why is it there? Well, it turns out when you actually talk to the writing faculty, most students who get C's haven't shown up to class very much. Someone told me there's a relationship between showing up to class. <laughs> I know it's how I got a 1.8 my first semester. <laughs> Pinter. Calculus, 8 a.m., three days a week. Vin wasn't there. He got a D. Hardest conversation I ever had with Vincent Del Casino Sr. was after I got that 1.8. <laughs> it was a short conversation. He said, Ben, do it again. You're going to Nassau Community College, and you're leaving your liberal arts college in, in Pennsylvania. 3-2, 3-3, 3-5, 3-7, 3 Okay. So we wrote a cheeky response when a B isn't good enough. Of course, really, the only people, only people read the salacious article that said we were going to destroy the university with data analytics. But in this, we actually make the argument that, you know, we're, there are blind spots in our understanding of where students fall down. And there's an opportunity within the machine learning and the technologies to start to think about the implications of this. Pedagogically, we can reimagine some of the skills that we talk about, and we can elevate the things that are matter in a big data world. Data literacy, technological literacy, start to organize our curriculum around this, inclusive literacy. Here's the thing we know machine learning doesn't do very well. It doesn't yet understand the nuances of all the differences that we have in the world. We do, though, and if it matters to us, we can teach people how to engage it. Creative literacy. This is another thing in a big data world. We could take those data. John actually sent me this article. It was fantastic about an artist that's using all these data to create art. That sense of creativity, that's something humans still have that machines aren't quite caught up on yet. Why do you mash different things together to produce new effects? You know, why do you start to paint certain ways? How do we bring art and science together? Methodological literacy. I think. We will be remiss if at the end of the big data revolution, everyone's one kind of computational scientist. I think the university will have failed itself if it doesn't enliven ethnographers 
and other kinds of qualitative researchers, as well as other different methodological practices. And environmental literacy. We know we still care about this planet, and we have to make sure that that stays elevated in our curriculum. This is a response to how we can think about why our value matters. The other thing, then, is higher education really teaches us to diversify our skills. We have to challenge the notion that one major leads to one career. There's a real downward pressure right now from legislators, from other kinds of communities that are like, all right, we want people to be trained for the workforce. But we already know in the big data revolution, the workforce isn't going to look the same. And if we train everybody in this one thing, then we're just going to have to train them in something else. And so if we organize around literacy skills, majors lead to all kinds of careers, and careers lead to all kinds of lifelong learning. We need to organize ourselves in reaction to this sort of world in order to really affect change and bring people back so they're continuing to move themselves along. The other thing is we have to create multiple learning pathways. We have to think about where the skills are going to be picked up. And this is really interesting for me. I'm, you know, the question, I've been thinking about this question a lot, and higher ed has been thinking about it a lot. When you're a faculty member, you're trained that the classroom and the curriculum is the place where the learning happens. And then as you start to kind of look around, you go, wow, there's all this learning happening all over the place. How do we bring that into conversation with other things? In, in the example of design thinking, right, you can bring students together in a way that's very transformative that's not necessarily in, in a class. In the context of this particular project, here, 125 students have volunteered to do a project for facilities management. They come from all over the university, and they're connecting and building interdisciplinary teams. It's, it's kind of exciting. So we can respond by reimagining the way we do teaching and learning at the institution to go, you know what, if the data are going to move around, so does the learning. Now, we also have to intensify the conversations that are going on. And I stole this from Nirov, who talked about the relationship between domain scientists, your biologists collecting a lot of data, and computational scientists. All those people are learning how to take that data up and do kinds of amazing things with it. But I think we also have to ask, where are the sociocultural theorists in all of this? And I could have kept going. Where are the artists, right? Where are the humanities scholars? And I think the future of the university is we have to reflect on the intersections of these data and this computational thinking from multiple angles so that we understand what we're producing here at the university and what sort of effect it's going to have out there in the world. And this is an important question for us to ask. So perhaps the most provocative thing, and then I'll probably run away, um, is the notion that maybe disciplines are not our future. We have organized ourselves around disciplinary learning. The data don't care. They don't care if you're a geographer or a computer scientist or an anthropologist. The data are coming at us in all kinds of ways. And perhaps disciplines are actually not the right way to organize institutions like this in relation to that churn. I don't know what that looks like exactly, but you can imagine an undergraduate curriculum in higher education down the road organized around problems or questions right, and not disciplinary knowledge. There's a trade-off there. There's a crisis that could be produced where we would lose depth, right? But we have to ask ourselves, what are the risks and what are the benefits? These are the questions we have to churn on. And so you could think, all right, everyone's got to fit the institutional system. And we know universities actually don't like to change a lot. By the way, the, other defini the first definition of discipline is a sense of punishment. <laughs> if you've ever run a faculty meeting, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so perhaps higher education 
should reorganize itself around the grand challenges that are being produced by the relationships between the data, humans, and machines. When, when we think about what an honors education should look like or what an education for an undergraduate should look like, we have to think in different terms than we have in the past. And this is really important. So within all this then, we ask ourselves the question, can a higher education address the grand challenges brought about by the new relations between humans, data, and machines? I don't have an answer. <laughs> but I have another question. Stefan said to me, wow, Vin, you're really good at asking questions. I'm like, yep, that's what my job is. I'm supposed to ask a lot of questions, and then you all get to think about what to talk about next, right? Stefan started this series with the ship of Theseus. And the ship of Theseus is sort of an answer to that question I just posed. The question of the ship of Theseus is, over time, they're replacing boards on this ship to the point where eventually every board is different than the original ship. And half the philosophers in the room said it's the same exact ship, and half the philosophers in the room said it's a different ship. We're going to have to ask ourselves, are we going to be on the same ship or a different ship? And what does that ship look like in the future? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vin. And thank you all, and we'll see you next year. Thank you for coming. Thank you.